Welcome, and thanks for joining us all here at Faith Lutheran Church in DeMott, Indiana. Before we get into today's message, we'd like to encourage you to connect with God and His Word today by pulling out your Bible and reading the passages that we're focusing on today for yourself. Feel free to pause the video and take your time. Now let's see what Pastor Brett Zakoviak has to say for us today. You may have seen these things before. Uh, sometimes they come in the form of a laminated card that you might find in a Christian bookstore, or maybe it's in the back page of a Bible in a hotel room. But they have these lists of biblical passages to look up when you are in need of a word from God. On the left-hand side of the card are different situations in life, like when you worry, when you feel alone, when you struggle with temptation, when you have financial trouble. And then on the right-hand side are passages that you should read to deal with each of those situations. So, for example, when you're worried, you might be directed to look up 1 Peter 5, 7. And there you read, cast all of your anxieties on God because he cares for you. And it's a quick, easy way to find a Bible passage that speaks to what you are feeling. I mean, the last thing you want when a person is worried is for them to open up their Bible and, and read about God striking Ananias and Sapphira dead in their tracks, or, or God sending uh, bears to kill 42 children for mocking the prophet Elisha. Those aren't the kinds of places that are going to bring any kind of peace in the midst of anxiety. It's much safer to open the Bible to one of these pre-selected verses and then start reading there. Now, while the listing of passages can indeed be comforting, the difficulty is that sometimes people never move beyond reading the Bible in this way. They open the pages, they find that comforting word that, that helps make them feel better, and then they close the book, set it aside, never entering through this door into the deeper, richer story of the scriptures. And in that sense, Christianity becomes something that it was never, ever intended to be, a private, personal religion. It becomes something that you turn to, not when you enter the world, but when you retreat from it. It's something that you read in your private devotional time, and you look forward to that moment when it's just you and Jesus. God becomes something like our best friend, if you will. A person who supports us when times get tough, and someone who helps us accomplish our plans and, and fulfill all our dreams. The problem, of course, is that such an approach reverses roles with God. Rather than us being servants in God's kingdom, God becomes a servant in ours. Rather than us being brought into God's greater story, we bring God into our smaller story. Now in this series, we've seen that the main actor in God's greater story isn't us at all, but God. I mean, he was there at the beginning, creating the world and all of the cosmos. He'll, he'll be there at the end, bringing about a new and glorious recreation. And in between the beginning and the end, God is here. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working in love and ruling over ruins. So now we're going to move beyond just God to see how God's greater story involves also a greater people. While God certainly is present in the small Bible passages that a person might read in a lonely hotel room, his vision is much greater than that. God has come in Jesus Christ not only to save you and to save every other individual person, but also to join you to a people, a people who live by his promise and his purpose in his kingdom. In our text this morning, we find Paul focusing in on that people. But it's a very private, personal moment. It's a painful moment as he's engaged in prayer. Now, I don't know if you've ever come before God on behalf of someone that you care about, 
Someone who will have nothing to do with the faith. But if you have, you can kind of sympathize with Paul here. And you love that person. And you know that God loves that person. You know that God desires that person to be saved. And yet the person wants nothing whatsoever to do with any of it. And so you stand alone. Not because you don't trust in God, but because your friend, your, your mother, your son doesn't. If you've ever been there, you have a clue of what Paul is experiencing. It's this personal, painful prayer. He cries out, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Paul is concerned about his kinsmen. He's concerned about the Jewish people. See, five years before Paul wrote this, the Jewish people had been expelled from Rome because of some civil unrest. And when that emperor died, his expulsion order died with him. So the Jewish people were now starting to return to Rome. But how would the church receive them? See, what started as a movement of faith among the Jews was now predominantly Gentile. The church had remained in Rome, even though the Jews had been sort of kicked out, and it grew with Gentile believers. And so Paul was worried not only about the Jews who didn't believe, but for also those who did believe, wondering if the Gentiles in Rome would see any reason to care for them once they return. Earlier in the letter, Paul asks a very important question regarding God and his relationship with the Jewish people. As he revealed that all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God, Paul asked, then what advantage has the Jew? And we would expect Paul to say none. I mean, that is all are sinful and all are justified by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Therefore, there should be no advantage to being a Jew. But surprisingly, Paul says that they have much advantage in every way. To begin with, he says the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. And Paul continues that same thought here. He says they are Israelites, and to them belongs the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises, the patriarchs. And from their race, according to the flesh, comes Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. And this moment of personal prayer is one that's wrapped up in this larger story of God, a story that began and involved the Jewish people. And so Paul isn't praying for himself, but he's praying for God's people. He isn't setting before God his day and his plans and asking for God to bless those plans. No, Paul finds God's greater story set before him. He's praying for fulfillment of what God has planned. This is a story of promise, a promise to bless all of the nations on earth. And that story, and that promise, comes to shape Paul's life and Paul's prayer. And you notice how Paul is willing to die for the sake of the Jews. And he knows that they haven't all believed in Jesus. And because of the expulsion of the Jews from Rome, it would be very easy for the Christian church in that place to become a Gentile church altogether. But Paul finds himself overwhelmed with, with pain, personal love. He wishes that he himself could be cut off from Christ. If that would be enough, if that would do it, if that could save the Jewish people, he would be cut off himself from Christ. His heart is filled with the love of Jesus. I mean, remember, Jesus is the very one who is willing to be cut off from God, his Father. He's the one who was willing to drink 
the cup of his father's wrath, who was willing to be forsaken by God and condemned to hell, that the kingdom of God might be open to all people who trust in him. In him is, is forgiveness, it's, it's life and everlasting salvation. In him is the promise that your sins are forgiven and the promise that you are now part of God's people. People who live by that promise as part of God's greater story. So how does this relate to us today? Well, sometimes we can lose sight of that larger story. We turn faith into a personal matter, a private experience that, that gets us through the week. Paul awakens us today, however, to the fact that, that we are part of a much greater people who live by the promise of God. You know, Luther pastor once took part in an evangelism experience in Israel. And he worked with a leader named O'Neill, who worked with the Kaspari Center in Jerusalem. And at one point, the pastor was listening to Bodil talk with a Jewish woman who did not believe in Christ. And the woman asked Bodil why she was so concerned about her. After all, she says, you have your Bible and you have your Jesus and I have my scriptures and I have my God. Why do I need to believe in your Jesus? And Bodil looked at the woman and she said, if my Jesus isn't your Messiah, then I don't want. She says, your scriptures are my scriptures. Your God is my God, she said. And if Jesus is not your Messiah, then I don't want him, and I will wait instead for the one whom God promised. And this pastor was, was surprised by O'Neill's answer. See, for years he had looked at the Old Testament scriptures as helpful, for proving that Jesus was God. And so he would pick and choose among passages to help people see how they pointed to Jesus, not unlike that little card that tells you which verse to read in which situation. And so the Old Testament was useful for pointing to Jesus, but he'd much rather focus on the Gospels. He'd much rather focus on the epistles of Paul or other New Testament books. Sermons rarely worked with the Old Testament, Bible classes were the same way. So for him, how strange it was to hear Bodil's answer, because she started with the Old Testament. She said these were her scriptures. These were her words from God. And if Jesus didn't fulfill these scriptures, then she was going to hold on to that Old Testament and wait for the Messiah that God promised. Now, while the woman that O'Neill talked to didn't come to the faith that day, the pastor who overheard her was brought into a deeper belief. See, he began to see how God had brought him into a much larger story. The God who created all things called forth a people. And to them he gave promises and prophets. And now, this pastor in Christ was part of that people in the body of Christ, the church. The prophets, they, they weren't just books with little passages that, that he might relate to Jesus. They were part of this larger vision and glory of God. And yes, that vision was still centered in Jesus, but, but it was much richer and fuller than the pastor had ever known before. I mean, consider, consider the Old Testament reading this morning. Evening, sorry. The Old Testament reading, which we didn't read here, talks about Isaiah's promise. Isaiah's promise that, that all of God's people will be fed. It's a picture of a great banquet that God will provide. And the Gospel reading is then the feeding of the 5,000. That's why those two readings are, are paired together. It's God's call to his people to come and to eat. But this is more than just a foretaste of the feeding of the 5,000. This is part of God's eternal vision for a banquet for all peoples. We begin to overhear God's promises through the Old Testament to feed and to care for his people. And from that, the manna that falls from heaven 
to the table that the Lord our shepherd prepares in Psalm 23. This banquet lies behind the banquet parables of Jesus. And this banquet, this eschatological feast that he's promising in the kingdom of God lies ahead for all of us as part of God's people gathered from, from all nations who live by the promises of God. And so rather than opening the Bible and trying to, to use God in our lives, we find that God opens the scriptures and brings us into that story and the life of his people in this world. And there's a painting that captures what that looks like. You can see it in your bulletins if you like. It used to be on an altar in Siena. It was one of five small paintings that sat on an altar piece, right along the bottom. And this painting is of the Annunciation, it's a fancy church word for that moment when Mary received word from the angel Gabriel that she was chosen to bear the Savior. And Mary is seated alone in a room. And in fact, she could very easily have been at prayer private, personal, prayer. But before her stands Gabriel, bearing this message from God. And when you look at the painting closely, however, there's something else going on there. See, the artist has taken Mary in this house where she is praying in and places it right on the edge of the Garden of Eden. There, just outside her window, Adam and Eve are being banished by God the Father. And as God the Father extends his arm to banish them, however, something really beautiful happens in this painting. If you follow God's arm, you see that God is pointing from that garden straight at the Virgin Mary. God sends Adam and Eve out of the garden, but he does so with a promise. A promise that there will come a day when the woman will have an offspring who will bruise the head of Satan and rescue his people from sin. And Adam and Eve and all of those who lived after them, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, David, Solomon, Isaiah and Malachi, all of them were people of this promise. And now here in this small room, in this, this private moment of prayer, God brings Mary into that story as well. And in her words of love and self-sacrifice, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. God continues his greater story of bringing about salvation in this world. Her private prayer was a moment when God brought her into the story of his it was true for Mary. It was true for the Apostle Paul and Romans, and it's true for you and me. Today, as God has chosen to bring you into this larger story, to be part of a people who live by his promise, and in self-sacrificial love, we seek to serve him here in this place and anywhere that God takes us through our lives. May the peace that comes from knowing that promise, from knowing that God has joined you to something far greater than yourself, may that guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now and always. Amen. Thanks so much for connecting with us today. We'd love the chance to get to know you better. So please take some time and come join us in person for one of our services on site. You can find out more information on our website at www.faithdemont.org. Go in peace, serve the Lord, thanks be to God.